I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> well, Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just fine. I've been having a wonderful time making snowmen. Oh, that's marvelous. Yes. The snow is two feet deep, and I've been playing fox and the geese. I just love to play fox and the geese. So do I. Oh, I like the winter. You can make up such nice things out of your head with the snow. Yes, I made an interesting thing out of my head one time in the winter. What? An icicle on the end of my nose. Huh? Oh, that's funny. Now, please read me the funny. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page... Oh, Hop Along Cassidy. And we'll read Hop Along Cassidy right now. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. <laughs> Hoppy has been captured by the outlaw gang, headed by a girl named Calico. The gang has been operating a mine, and Hoppy has been put to work underground in the mine. As Hoppy works, he looks up, and he sees Calico standing on the other side of the little dump car. Hoppy says, Well, I figured you'd be showing up sooner or later, Calico. Calico tells him that she can use a man like him, and she offers him a place in her organization. First picture, next row, she tells him to write a farewell letter to his Bar 20 friends, telling them that he won't be back. She tells Hoppy she can't risk having a search party show up looking for him. Hoppy realizes that this might be one way of outsmarting Calico. So he tells her, Calico, you've just taken on a new hand. Third picture, second row. As they approach the shack where her office is, Hoppy tells Calico, I'll tell the Bar 20 bunch that I'm quitting the ranch and going into the mining business somewhere. Calico asks him how he's going to make sure that they believe him. Last picture of the row, Hoppy picks up a handful of pyrite dust from the desk, which is what they've been mining, and he says, I'll enclose a sample of pyrite dust as proof. <laughs> Second picture, bottom row, Hoppy hands Calico a letter, enclosing the pyrite dust, and signed in his hand. Calico thanks him, then smiles coldly, saying that at last she has him in her power, that no one will come here looking for him now. Hoppy asks, what do you mean? Calico's henchman holds a gun on him last picture, saying, you just writ your own death warrant. And Calico says, take him away, Bullwhip. I have an important letter to mail. Oh, that was a mean thing to do, to get Hoppy to write that letter by a trick like that. Yes, you just can't trust thieves. No. Now will they kill Hoppy? Well, it looks like they're going to try to. Oh, and there's so many people around that mine. I don't know how Hoppy's going to escape from them. Well, next week we'll find out about that. Now, now what? Well, now could we please read Pinch Valiant? Certainly. Let's turn over the page. And there, on page three, is Prince Valiant. Oh, and last week it was so romantic. Indeed it was, because Black Robert and Sir Reef Hook are at war with each other. And Sir Reef Hook had captured Black Robert's son and tied him to a stake right inside of the enemy. Yes, he'd hoped that Black Robert would surrender when he saw that his son was captured. But instead, he attacked it. And then Sir Reef Hook's beautiful daughter chained herself to the stake, too, because she was in love with Adrian. That's Black Robert's son. And then the battle stopped, and Val cut the two lovers loose from the stake. And now please read so we can see what happens next. Very well. Here we go with Prince Valiant and the Days of King Arthur. Hackett, Brackett, Grey Mulkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> prince Valiant releases the two lovers and stands back, a satisfied smile on his face. Surely, he thinks, their romantic plight will stop the war. At last picture top row, 
Slowly, his expression changes as an angry murmur rises to a roar. It seems that no one save he and the two lovers wants peace. Val sees the grim look on Black Robert's face, first picture next row. He's broken through the wall of Sir Ree's castle, and Black Robert thinks that the long dispute should end in victory for him. Val quickly looks at Sir Ree, and he sees the grim look on Sir Ree's face also. Sir Ree is thinking that if the promised help arrives this day and attacks his enemy in the rear, that Sir Ree can win, and he will be master of all the lands thereabout. Then Val looks at the army of fighting men, last picture of the row. The soldiers on Egypt's side, not knowing the true state of affairs, are confident of victory, and they think only of the rich plunder that they can all go home with, spoils of the battle. Val has to think fast. He has a quest to complete, and except for his love of a good fight, he has no interest in this quarrel. Then, first picture, bottom row, he shouts, Hold! The power of Rome is gone, and the barbarians are sweeping all Europe. So deed the disputed lands to your children, they to wed and unite your two houses. Three strongholds may well carry you through the troubled times to come. A long silence follows his words and ends in the rattle of swords returning to their scabbards as Sir Ree and Black Robert see the wisdom of Val's words and decide to agree on peace. And the fighting is over. <laughs> That's right. Val has shown them that a huge army of cruel men are going to attack their land soon, and that Black Robert and Sir Ree will be wiser to be friends and stick together and defend their land. Oh, I'm glad Val settled things so nicely. I like people to have peace and live happily ever after, especially when they're in love. So do I. Now? Oh, now? Now would you please read me Flash Gordon? I certainly will. Let's go over the page past page four. Past the Lone Ranger on page five. Turn over that page... And there on page seven is Flash Gordon. I've been so worried because that mean old wizard is going to attack Flash and Dale and Queen Suni. They're in the cave. Yes, they're in the cave where Prince Fino and his men have been manufacturing metal weapons, which is against the wizard's law. And the wizard wants to destroy Flash and Dale and Suni so that he can be the ruler of the planet. And he's had some special machine brought up that's supposed to melt the earth even. Yes, so let's read and find out if that really happens. So here we go with Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. The wizard Curzo has brought up the huge projector and aimed it at the earth in front of the dragon's cave where Flash and Dale are. Then he turns on the rays, aiming them at the earth in front of the cave. The rays melt the metal in the mines, causing violent earthquakes. Goro pleads, Stop! You'll bury Queen Suni! Curzo dooms her along with Flash and Dale. Let the earth swallow them all! <laughs> Meanwhile, last picture, top row. Dale and Flash. Dale and Flash see the entrance of the cave crumbling in upon them. Dale is sure they're going to be buried alive. But Flash leads the way deeper into the smugglers' caverns. He warns... The exit tunnel is caved in. We must find another way out before the ray crushes us all. First picture, bottom row. The caves end at an underground river that ran the smuggler's power plant. Flash admits, we don't know where it goes, but we'll find out. Our one chance is to follow the river away from the wizard's ray. Dale and Suni work with the men, throwing together crude rafts. Racks and shutters in the cavern walls warn that time is running short. In a short time, Flash and the rest are on their rafts, last picture, seeking to escape by the way of the underground river. And with a few salvage tools and weapons, the little fleet drifts deeper into the underworld, just as the cavern collapses behind them. It certainly was. Maybe if the river is long enough and they can travel fast enough, they can come out far from where the wizards are. Yes, and maybe then they can think of some way of fixing that old wizard good. Well, let's hope so. And we'll find out next week in the River of Peril. And now it's time for... Oh, well, I hope Dagwood and Blondie, because Dagwood does such funny things. Well, you hope right, because it is. So pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly, and here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. 
Ramafoo, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood has borrowed a neighbor's ladder to repair his radio aerial on the top of his house. And he's returning the ladder, saying, Well, thanks for the use of your ladder, Mr. Brump. I repaired my aerial. Mr. Brump replies, Well, you're welcome, Dagwood. So Dagwood walks back home. Just as he's about to go into the house, Blondie looks up on the roof and exclaims, Dagwood, you left Daisy up on the roof. Dagwood looks up and sure enough sees their dog, Daisy, sitting on the top of the roof looking quite nervous. <laughs> Dagwood dashes back to Mr. Brump. And last picture top row asks him, Oh, Mr. Brump, may I borrow your ladder again? Mr. Brump replies, Well, I just loaned it to Mr. Swabley. The storm wrecked his aerial, too. So Dagwood dashes over to Mr. Swabley's house. And first picture next row, seeing Mr. Swabley's up on the roof, says, Well, I'll just borrow it for a moment while he's working on his aerial. So Dagwood takes the ladder and walks off with it. At this moment, Mr. Swabley, who is through working on his aerial, begins to crawl backwards down the roof on his hands and knees without looking where he's going to where he's sure the ladder is. When he gets to the edge of the roof, suddenly... He's fallen from the roof to the ground. A moment later... Dagwood has put the ladder against his house and he's climbed up to the roof. All of a sudden, last picture of the row, he feels the ladder pulled away from the house and finds himself in the air with nothing to hang on to. And he looks down and sees Swabley and shrieks, Hey, quit pushing that ladder! Mr. Swabley snarls, Well, you took it from under me! And drops the ladder. Sending Dagwood head first to the ground, Mr. Swabley stands there shrieking with laughter. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha! Dagwood leaps to his feet, and in a second, Swabley and Dagwood are swapping bumps, punches, and kicks, snarling at each other like two dogs. Mr. Brump comes running and hollers, Hey, quit, 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 quit fighting over my ladder. And he picks up the ladder, last picture of the row, as the two men stop fighting, and he walks off with it saying, Just for acting like hoodlums, I won't let either of you use it. And Dagwood peevishly calls after him, Oh, keep your old ladder. And when he sees that Mr. Brump is really carrying the ladder off, Dagwood leaps to his feet, first picture bottom row, shakes his fist at Mr. Brump and hollers, Keep it! Keep it! I wouldn't borrow it again for a million dollars! Keep your old ladder! And then he starts to go into the house when Blondie points to Daisy, who is tired of waiting on top of the roof. And Blondie says, You forgot about Daisy. She's still up on the roof. And Dagwood exclaims, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. And a moment later, there is a knock on Mr. Brump's door. When Mr. Brump opens the door, he finds Dagwood standing there. And Dagwood sweetly says, Oh, Mr. Brump, may I borrow your ladder? (laughs) Isn't that funny? (laughs) When Dagwood told Mr. Brump he wouldn't borrow the ladder again for a million dollars, and then just a minute later, he's asking him just the sweetest pie if he can borrow the ladder. (laughs) He certainly looks silly. (laughs) Yes, but look at Mr. Brump. (laughs) Listen to him. He's mad. Let's get away from here quick. Very well. Let's get down to where Roy Rogers is. And here he is right below Dagwood and Blondie. And I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the bottom of the first page of the second section... Roy Rogers. Yes, Roy Rogers. Today's the day we ought to run into something really exciting because Knuckles Hardy and Furhead Fenton and Nitro Kane have gone off to set the explosion that'll blow up the riverbank so the water will run onto the Box 8's ranch, which is owned by Knuckles Hardy. And that's against the law, isn't it? Yes, because it means that the other ranchers won't have water on their land. He's doing a bad, mean, selfish thing. Yes, and now Tommy, who is Knuckle Hardy's son... And Roy are on their way to see if they can prevent the big explosion. Yes, and the thing that makes it so exciting is that Tommy doesn't know that it's his father that they're after. No. So now let's read and see what happens with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. <laughs> ah, yip, hi-yo. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Ah, yip, hi-yo. <laughs> Roy and Tommy gallop along the trail leading to the river. Tommy says, hey, This trail brings us out of the top of the falls, Roy. Roy replies, Good. That's a logical place to blow the river and divert it from its natural bed. <laughs> Me 
Meanwhile, at the falls of Rapid River, Knuckles, Nitro, and Furhead are coming out of a cave in the river bank. Nitro says, Are the timer set? In five minutes, the explosives in the cave will blow the river bank sky high. The three men hurriedly walk away from the cave to reach a safe spot before the explosion occurs. Knuckles Hardy says, Well, I hired you for this job, Nitro Kane. They better come off right. I'll control the whole valley. And they'll all come to me for water, blast them. Last picture, top row, as they reach a spot above the cave, Nitro says, Three more minutes and boom. Meanwhile, at this moment, Roy and Tommy stop at a point above the cave. Tommy says, There's a cave down on that ledge, Roy. I used to play in it. Roy replies, well, My hunch is that they'll plant the dynamite in there if they want to divert the river in a big way. So they head for the cave to look around, unaware that the explosion is almost ready to go off. Suddenly, Tommy slips, almost falls over the cliff into the river, calling, Help, Roy, my foot's slipping! At this moment, Furhead Fenton, some distance away, exclaims, Hey, look, it's Rogers and your kid, Mr. Hardy. Yeah, the blower boy slipped to the ledge. Knuckles replies in horror, He'll be blowing up in the river. Kane, do something to stop it, quick! Nitro says, Well, it's too late now, Knuckles. She's due to blow. Knuckles replies, Let go, I gotta help my boy up there. Tommy, look out! Dynamite in the cave! <laughs> exciting. I won't have any fingernails left. Yeah, this is a tense moment. Well, my, what can Roy possibly do? He's right on top of the explosion. Well, let's hope that Knuckles Hardy calls to Roy and tells him where the explosion is so Roy can disconnect the fuses. Oh, I can wait and can hardly wait to find out. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to. But in the meantime, let's go over the page past Jungle Jim, across to page three, and there is Barney Google. And under that is Uncle Remus. And of course, well, of course, you're not interested in that. Oh, I am so. You know I am. I just love Bear Rabbit. Oh, well, pardon me. Let's stop right here then, and I'll read Uncle Remus and his tales of Rare Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it, it a habit, habit to, to give, give us music for old, old Bear Rabbit. Rabbit. Uncle Remus says. One time, Brer Bar got to bragging he was the most powerful critter in the whole county. That is, to your Brer Rabbit showed him different. Brer Rabbit and Brer Coon are strolling through the woods one day when they see Brer Bear and Brer Buzzard sitting around a campfire warming a pan of soup, talking. They hear Brer Bear say, Duh, yes, sir, Brer Buzzard. Die is the strongest man in the whole community. And Brer Buzzard answers, yeah, you sure is a big hunk of muscle, Brer Bar. And Brer Rabbit says, Uh-oh, something is commencing. And then Brer Rabbit hears Brer Buzzard ask, hey, Can you up, old man, Bob can't? And Brer Bar replies, Duh, shucks, I can whoop anybody. Brer Rabbit has a bright idea, and he says to his companion, Hey, come on, Brer Coon, I know somebody he can't whoop. And off they skitter. <laughs> a little later, Brer Bear and Brer Buzzard are eating their soup around the campfire. Brer Bear is still bragging, and he says, Duh, I ain't a scared of any critter in all these parts. I can whoop them all. And Brer Buzzard asks, Can you whoop more brown moose? And Brer Bear replies, last picture, top row, Duh, I can even whoop brown moose. And all of a sudden, out of the bushes behind his head, a moose head appears. And the moose gives Brer Bear a good bite on the head. <coughs> no! And Brer Buzzard leaps to his feet, trembling with fear, saying, Yeah, he's getting out of here. And Brer Bear looks over his shoulder and sees Brer Moose's head ferociously staring at him. And down the road, Brer Bear and Brer Buzzard scoot. And Brer Bear calls back, I was only fooling Brer Moose. And a second later, Brer Rabbit pops his head through the bushes and giggles as he sees Brer Bear run away. <laughs> Bless my eyeballs. And Brer Coon pops through the bushes and says, Well, old Brer Moose sure showed him. And last picture, Brer Rabbit and Brer Coon are carrying a moose head mounted on a plaque heading back for home. And Br'er Coon says, Yeah, we better get this moose head back on the cabin wall quick. And Br'er Rabbit giggles, Yeah, what you suppose will happen if Br'er Bar ever meets the real Br'er Moose? And Uncle Remus says, Little head kin a heap of times outdo a big body. <laughs> yes, they took a head of a moose that was mounted on a plaque off the cabin wall, sneaked around the bushes where Br'er Rabbit was sitting, 
<laughs> and then they stuck the head through the bushes, and Bear Bear only saw the head, and he thought it really was Bear Moose. Yes, Bear Rabbit <laughs> certainly knows cute tricks. Yes, he certainly does. Well, now let's go over to the last page and see what new development has taken place with Dick, who is with George Washington in the early days of America. Oh, and a very wonderful thing happened last week. You remember? Dick was captured by the Hesh, uh, Hesh German soldiers. Yes, you really mean the Hessian soldiers who were on the English side. Yes, and they'd captured Dick, and then Dick told them that George Washington would give them farms if they would join on their side, and they did. I was so proud of Dick when he walked into George Washington's camp with those soldiers. So was I, and so was George Washington, because George Washington needs soldiers. Oh, please, let's read and see what'll happen next. Very well, here we go with Dick's adventures, and say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. To make certain that the Hessian soldiers are not up to any trickery, Washington has put them under guard. One of the captured Hessians stammer, If we were told the Americans are cowards, that they won't fight, are ready to surrender. Dick glances back to see Washington smiling. Dick walks off to the outskirts of the camp and sees a group of the American soldiers with packs on their backs. He greets them. Oh, hi, fellas. I got great news. Washington's not beat by a long shot. He... Hey, where are you all going? The men stop sullenly, and first picture next row from a dozen men. Dick gets the same story. They've had enough soldiering. They're heading home. They're going to desert. One soldier holds up his foot and shows Dick stockings and shoes that are full of holes and exclaims, Hey, look at these shoes. No new ones and no food. Another soldier exclaims, Everybody knows it. The war's lost. And still another exclaims, And we only enlisted for six months. The time's up. Dick looks at him, last picture of the row, and exclaims, Hey, wait, listen to me. You can't do this to the, to the people who are going to be Americans after you. We're going to win. I know it. But Dick walks back to the camp slowly and sadly. He comes by the stockade where Washington has locked up the Hessian soldiers. One of the soldiers sticks his head out, first picture, bottom row, exclaiming, Ah, uh, brave men in your American army, those who are left, huh? The British tell us right that Washington soon surrender, yeah? Dick exclaims angrily, you're wrong. Then he walks over to the edge of the encampment, last picture, sadly leans against a tree and says to himself, Gosh, I knew things were tough in 1776, but I never figured they were this tough. And then Dick is suddenly aware that Washington is standing beside him. <laughs> wanting to go home. Yes, the hard thing about being a soldier is waiting for things to happen. It takes a lot of patience to train and to drill, especially when you don't have good food and warm clothes. But maybe Washington can encourage the soldiers and then maybe they will, they just won't go home. Well, maybe he'll have some plan. Well, we'll find out about it next week. Yes, I hope so. Yes. Now look underneath Dick's adventures. Here's Rusty Riley. Oh, and this is becoming very mysterious because Rusty had trailed Squire Boggs and Captain Coon at night and he discovered that they were using the black light. The same kind of black light the smugglers were using. And then Flip barked and Squire Boggs found Rusty and he's taken him on board an old ship and he's locked him down below while he and Captain Clune do something very mysterious. And I'm anxious to find out what it is that they're doing. Well, let's find out right now. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. On the wharf, Captain Clune and Squire Boggs quickly work, storing away some mysterious cylinders which have been attached to the lobster pot markers by the smugglers and which they've pulled out of the water. Meanwhile, second picture, below the deck, inside the old schooner hulk, Rusty is looking out a window, and he says, Golly, Squire Boggs told me to watch from this window, but I don't see anything. There's nobody down there. Rusty decides to try to get out, so he climbs up to the hatch. He tries to open the hatch, which is a door to the deck. And he exclaims, Gee, I can't budge this hatch cover. Golly, they've locked me in. Meanwhile, at Mr. Miles' boathouse, Mr. Kilgore, the government treasury agent, a man who is the same as a detective, has joined Tex at the spot where Rusty is supposed to have gone. As they walk along the shore, trying to trail Rusty, Tex is saying, Well, I can't figure where the lad could have gone, Mr. Kilgore. 
He's not out on the water because none of our boats is missing. Mr. Kilgore replies thoughtfully. Well, then there's only one way he could have gone, Tex. That's along the path that skirts the shore. So last picture, top row, they head off in the same direction as Rusty had gone. First picture, bottom row, Kilgore says, And don't you think he may have just gone off on a little lark without telling you, Tex? Tex replies, No, that ain't like the lad, Mr. Kilgore. Not after I told Patty and him to go to their room. <laughs> At this moment, Rusty, who is looking out the porthole of the old schooner Hulk, suddenly says to Flip, By golly, there's a rope hanging down from the deck. I believe I can reach it. He reaches out and gets the rope, pulls it in through the porthole, and then says to Flip, I got it. Now to fix a sling for you, Flip, a loop under your front legs. And he ties the rope around Flip, then lifts Flip out of the porthole and slowly lets him down to the ground below, saying, There you are, Flip. Now wiggle loose like I taught you. And last picture, Rusty climbs out of the porthole and, curious to find out what Captain Kroon and Squire Boggs are up to, says, Well, now that Flip is safe, I think I'll try to climb to the deck. Oh, I I wish he wouldn't do that. I wish he would go down to the ground, too, and then slip away so that he would be safe. Yes, because if Squire Boggs and Captain Clune find out that Rusty discovers that they're in with the smugglers, you never know what they might do. Oh, I certainly hope that Tex and Mr. Kilgore get there soon. We'll, we'll find out about that next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Chronic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man.